Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I'm honored to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Connie Traub. Delirium is acute brain dysfunction. Delirium rates range from about 25% to greater than 50%. Who gets delirious? What does this delirium look like? How long does it last? When does it first occur? Delirium independently increases both length of PICU stay and length of hospital stay, which is the biggest driver of hospital costs. Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Kate Madden, an attending in critical care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I'm honored to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Connie Traub. Dr. Traub is an associate professor at Weill Cornell Medical College in pediatric critical care medicine. She's also a co-founder of the Weill Cornell Delirium Workgroup and one of the authors of the Cornell Assessment of Pediatric Delirium, which is a commonly used observational tool for screening delirium in the pediatric ICU. She has been publishing and speaking on the epidemiology of delirium and pediatric critical illness, the risk factors, the impact it may have, and possible treatment options in this population. She's been very active in the ICU community in bringing sedation and delirium to the forefront of discussions and is the chair of the ICU Liberation Committee in the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Connie, welcome. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you, Kate. It's an honor to be here. Welcome, Connie. We're so pleased to have you here with us today to talk about delirium. Maybe you could just start us off by telling us exactly what delirium is and critical illness. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so delirium is uh, acute brain dysfunction. It's a behavioral syndrome that occurs as a result of an underlying serious illness or as a side effect of treatment for that illness. The hallmarks of delirium is that it needs to be acute and fluctuating and involve a disturbance in two things. One is awareness or attention, and the other is cognition. Importantly, delirium is almost always reversible. Just like when you are severely ill, it can affect your kidneys or your liver, so too when you're severely ill, it can affect your brain. So the behavioral syndrome that we note is what we call delirium. There are different subtypes of delirium. So there's the hyperactive subtype, which I think comes to mind most often when we think about delirium. That's the agitated, restless child who interferes with our ability to care for them. So those kids tend to get our attention. The much more common subtype of delirium is the hypoactive subtype. That involves the apathetic child with decreased responsiveness. Those kids very often don't rise to the level of our awareness without routine screening. If you think about it, the child who just lies there in her bed and allows us to do whatever interventions are necessary to care for her without protesting much, that child we like. We call her a, a good patient. We don't necessarily recognize how inappropriate her behavior is developmentally, and we don't necessarily recognize her as having hypoactive delirium unless we have a high index of suspicion. The mixed delirium subtype are the children who vacillate between the two subtypes over the course of the day. And the more pediatric delirium research we do, the more we're coming to recognize that the vast majority of delirium in children is hypoactive or mixed, and the hyperactive, dramatic, agitated subtype is really only the tip of the iceberg. So people often ask what causes delirium, and the answer is that it's pathophysiology is incredibly complex and multifactorial. Simplistically, I like to think of delirium as being the result of three synergistic processes. One is the underlying disease that brought the child to the unit to begin with. The other is side effects of treatment for that disease. And the third is the highly abnormal environment in which these children are placed uh, while they're critically ill. As an example, we can take uh, almost any child in any of our units today. I, I can take uh, the baby with uh, RSV bronchiolitis and acute respiratory failure. So the underlying disease process, the respiratory failure with a concomitant hypoxia, puts this child at risk for delirium, as does the RSV infection itself. We then put this child on positive pressure ventilation, on invasive mechanical ventilation. The mechanical ventilator, the, the positive pressure, further increases delirium risk, as does the sedating medication that we prescribe to help the child tolerate the ventilator. We then take this baby who's used to sleeping at home on their belly in their crib and lie them flat on their back, usually mostly naked, in a cold ICU where they're exposed to lights and noise 24 hours a day. It's no wonder that this child is a setup for experiencing delirium during their critical illness. 
Regardless of whatever triggered the delirium, the final common pathway involves alteration in neurotransmission, uh, specifically acetylcholine, but all the neurotransmitters have been implicated. And this alteration in neurotransmission leads to the cognitive and behavioral changes that we recognize as delirium. And um, Connie, how can we detect de this delirium in our critically ill children? It's an excellent question. Until recently, we didn't really have uh, screening tools that were appropriate for use in children of all ages. Happily, that is no longer the case. There are now two different versions of screening tools that have been validated for use in the pediatric critical care unit. Uh, the first uh, that was developed was a tool called the Pediatric Confusion Assessment Method for the ICU. There's now a preschool version available as well. These tools can be used in kids six months to adulthood. Their tools are, are interactive and cognitively oriented, and they provide a point in time assessment for delirium. The other version of the tool was developed by my group. It's called the Cornell Assessment for Pediatric Delirium, and it's a, an observational tool that doesn't require the child to, uh, to interact, and it's scored towards the end of the nurse's shift. Both tools have been well validated with excellent inter-rater reliability in pediatrics. In fact, uh, the European Society for Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care has called for routine delirium screening in all critically ill children using the CAPD as standard of care. We'd like to turn to our audience now and ask a question. We ask that you state your city and country location when leaving a comment. Is your ICU currently screening for delirium, and which tool are you using? Now that we know how we can detect delirium in our patients, what have we learned about the type of patients who are at most risk for developing delirium? What we've learned, first of all, is that delirium is a very common complication of critical illness. I would venture to say it's almost an epidemic uh, in pediatric critical care. Delirium rates, based on the subgroup uh, studied, range from about 25% to greater than 50% in units all across the country and across the world. Uh, the largest delirium study was done by my group. Uh, this involved uh, 1,540 or so patients um, over the course of a calendar year. So what we wanted to do was figure out who gets delirious? What does this delirium look like? How long does it last? When does it first occur? And see if we can tease out some of the associated risk factors, specifically the modifiable factors, as well as the effect of delirium on short-term outcomes. So what we did is we uh, included every child admitted to my ICU over the course of a calendar year, and we screened each child for delirium every day, twice a day, from day of admission to the PICU until day of discharge. There are 1,547 subjects included and more than 7,500 uh, pediatric ICU days. Um, and what we found is that uh, delirium rates overall were about 17% in my unit and in children on invasive mechanical ventilation, about 35%. In fact, we found that when we looked at just those days on mechanical ventilation, 35% of those days were uh, characterized by delirium. About 21% were characterized by coma or pharmacologic sedation to the point where the child was unarousable. But 44% of the days were delirium-free and coma-free. And this was uh, pretty nice. This was a better number than we had found a few years earlier. I think we can still do better. I think we can increase that number to the greater than uh, 50th percentile. We also confirmed our hypothesis, which was that hyperactive delirium was only the tip of the iceberg. In our 7,500 or so patient days, only 8% of the days with delirium were hyperactive. Uh, the rest, the other 92%, were about evenly split between hypoactive and mixed delirium. The reason that's so important is that that's the kind of delirium that's missed without routine screening, and that's the kind of delirium that's associated with the worst outcomes. So that brings up an interesting question, which is that if this is such a common um, phenomenon in critically ill children, and if so much of it is hypoactive or not interfering with CARES, why should we be um, concerned about uh, identifying delirium in critically ill children? 
That is a fantastic question and one I get a lot. You know, if this is something that is so common, uh, maybe this isn't something that we can prevent. You know, we've been ignoring this problem as a community for decades. Why start paying attention now? So I'm going to answer that. But first, I'm going to paint a little picture for you of what delirium looks like. In this uh, 1,540 or so patient cohort, we actually found that of children who were ever delirious, so about the 250 or so children who experienced delirium during their ICU stay, the vast majority had their first day of delirium within their first two or three days in the ICU. So if you were ever gonna be delirious during your ICU stay, about 60% of the time you presented with delirium within the first few days. We also found that for about 60% of patients, delirium lasted two or fewer days. So to kind of reinforce your question, why bother paying attention to this early onset, short lasting phenomenon? Mm -hmm. We've talked about how delirium is almost always reversible. Why bother paying attention? The reason is that even this early onset short acting delirium is clearly and independently associated with poor outcome. Lest one think that delirium is a regional phenomenon, uh, this isn't, these aren't single institution findings any longer. Uh, we've completed and others have completed multi-institutional studies. One that I'm gonna highlight here included 25 sites and about 1,000 subjects. Um, prevalence rates overall were 25% and increased dramatically for children who were in the ICU for more than five days. And I think that's a really important fact for us to take notice of, which is that with increasing duration of exposure to the iatrogenic factors, the polypharmacy, the sleep deprivation, the immobility, we are increasing children's risk for developing delirium. That's very interesting because um, you had mentioned earlier that most delirium occurs in the first three days of ICU admission, um, but then the rates increase significantly after for the patients who um, are in the ICU for five or more days. Could you explain why that is? Absolutely. So the time to event, meaning for those who are ever going to be delirious, the first day with delirium is often early in the hospital course, within those first three days. That's incidence. But the prevalence of delirium, kind of the burden of delirium, um, on any given ICU day increases with increased duration in the ICU. So who are the children in the pediatric ICU who are most at risk for developing delirium? So with more and more delirium studies uh, being completed, single institution, multi-institution, we are finding that the children at highest risk are the youngest children, the children under the age of two. Uh, and this actually has great biological plausibility. This makes good sense. I like to think of age as a continuum. In the adult ICU population, the geriatric population are the patients at highest risk. I think similarly, at the extremes of age, the children under the age of two are at highest risk for developing delirium during the stress of critical illness. One can think of critical illness almost as a, uh, a stress test that unmasks lack of physiologic reserve. So just like geriatric patients have less cognitive reserve, so do do our children under two. In addition to age, children who are most severely ill seem to be at the highest likelihood of developing delirium during their critical illness, which makes great sense. Um, in addition, an independent risk factor for delirium, even after taking into account severity of illness, is positive pressure ventilation, need for invasive mechanical ventilation. We can't really do much about these risk factors. I can't control somebody's age or severity of illness. I'm certainly not gonna withhold positive pressure ventilation from a patient who needs it. Uh, that's just identifying for your staff who's at highest risk for developing delirium. What's more interesting to me are the, the modifiable factors, the things that are actually amenable to our intervention. So happily, we've actually been able to identify some factors that are at least potentially modifiable. Uh, a really, really important one, and one that I've been focusing on a lot recently, are our sedation practices, specifically benzodiazepines. So in the longitudinal cohort study that I described earlier, ever being prescribed benzodiazepines, even just for a day or two early in the course, increased delirium risk more than five-fold. This is after controlling for age, severity of illness, mechanical ventilation, and the other risk factors that are associated with delirium. This has now been shown in six separate studies 
over the past two years. The, in, uh, the international study that I had referenced earlier showed more than doubling of risk associated with benzodiazepines. This has been shown in a pediatric oncology ward. This has been shown in two separate cardiac intensive care units and in a single center PICU study, um, including some very young children, children six months to five years old out of Nashville. Um, in fact, a forest plot shows that the uh, independent association between benzodiazepines and delirium is almost fivefold. The overall odds ratio was a 4.8. But before we presume that an association, even a strong and independent association, is evidence of a causal relationship, we need to take many other things into account. One is temporality, right? Perhaps we're simply giving benzos to patients who are already delirious, or perhaps we're selecting for patients at highest risk in our prescribing practices. So a really interesting study was done by Dr. Calgi Modi, where she took a subset of about 580 children from the larger 1,500 plus patient cohort and took a really granular look at their medication exposures to see what their cognitive status was on the day when they received the benzodiazepines, what the dose of benzodiazepines they received was, and how this affected outcomes. She was able to show that when looking only at benzodiazepines given to children on days when they had normal cognitive status, in effect, benzodiazepines given to children without delirium, she was able to show an independent association with transition to delirium um, of more than fourfold. Receipt of benzodiazepines on a day with normal cognitive status more than quadrupled delirium rates uh, on the next day. She was even able to show a dose response effect where for every one log increase in benzodiazepine dose that was given on a day with normal cognitive status, there was a 43% increase in risk for transition to next day delirium. It's really tricky presuming causality with an observational data set. And one has to be very careful kind of not to over conclude. Happily, there's all kinds of sophisticated statistical modeling that allow for observational epidemiology to further explore uh, causal relationships. So in this cohort, what we were able to do is something called marginal structural modeling, which allows you to uh, pseudo-randomize your sample uh, to control all those time-dependent confounders. If you think about it, uh, we've talked about how delirium is uh, fluctuating. Just because you're delirious one day doesn't mean you're gonna be delirious the next. The question is, do benzodiazepines further increase the risk for next day delirium? And marginal structural modeling allows us to address that. And what this showed was that after taking into account cognitive status on the day the benzodiazepines were received, after taking into account mechanical ventilation, opiate exposure, severity of illness, et cetera, benzodiazepines independently increased subsequent delirium risk more than threefold. Again, we'd like to turn to our audience to ask a question. Please state your city and country when leaving your comment. What is your first line medication for sedation and analgesia in your ICU? Another really interesting modifiable factor uh, that's emerged recently in the pediatric literature is red blood cell transfusions. Dr. Marianne Nellis showed that ever receiving RBC transfusions independently uh, increased risk for delirium. This remained true after controlling for severity of illness. This even remained true after controlling for anemia. So in other words, the nadir hemoglobin did not predict delirium, the transfusion did. Most interestingly, uh, was the dose response relationship that she was able to show where for every 5 cc increase in amount of RBCs transfused, delirium rates rose. The reason why this is so exciting is that our transfusion practices are very much provider dependent. Transfusion thresholds are provider dependent and amount given in each transfusion is kind of at the whim of the prescriber. So some people will say, oh, well, once we're exposing them to blood, let's give them the whole unit or let's give the 15 cc's per kilo rather than 10. Um, and what this data shows is that there is kind of additive risk. So my hope is that in addition to all the other bad outcomes that we know are associated with RBC transfusions, this independent uh, risk for delirium will provide further pause prior to deciding to transfuse and that when we do transfuse, we'll be kind of stingy um, in the amount of blood that we give. That's really interesting. So what is the impact of um, delirium on the outcomes of pediatric critical illness? So there is a, a 
burgeoning literature, actually, that shows that delirium is associated with poor outcome in pediatrics. Um, several studies have shown that uh, delirium independently increases length of stay, both length of PICU stay and length of hospital stay. The usual predictors described in the literature of duration of hospitalization are severity of illness and need for mechanical ventilation. After uh, controlling for severity of illness using the pediatric index of mortality, and after controlling for need for mechanical ventilation, ever being delirious more than doubles ICU stay. This has been shown in three different studies now. Uh, it also has been linked to increased duration of mechanical ventilation. It, it takes longer to wean and extubate a delirious child when compared to a matched uh, patient who does not experience delirium. And again, this dose response effect that I talked about earlier, it's a really interesting study that came out of Germany uh, done by a Dr. Johann Mayberg, where he looked at delirium in children after elective surgery. So his ICU, I guess it's kind of like a post anesthesia care unit where he only admits children who've had major surgeries. And he screened those children for the first five post-operative days for delirium. And he divided them into three different groups children who never had delirium, children who had delirium for just one day, just 24 hours, and children who had delirium for two or more days. And he termed them no mild and severe delirium based on delirium duration. And he was able to show a biological gradient here, a dose response effect on outcomes, where even the children with only mild delirium, delirium that lasted one day or fewer, had increased duration of mechanical ventilation and increased length of stay. When he looked at children with delirium of two or more days, there was a further increase uh, in, those, in those bad outcomes. And that addresses the question you asked much earlier in our talk about why should I care about delirium that occurs early in the course and only lasts one day? Because even that delirium has been independently associated uh, with outcomes. There's also a huge association between delirium and hospital costs. Uh, delirium is expensive, not just in adults, but in pediatrics as well. We did a study which showed that the median cost of hospitalization was uh, about four times higher in children with delirium after controlling for length of stay, which is the biggest driver of hospital costs. We showed that delirium was expensive. A day with delirium is a costly day for the hospital. Median costs for a day with delirium are about $2,600 in my hospital as compared to $1,700 for that hospital day. And the reasons are many fold. Um, it's not just the staffing in the ICU stay. When children are delirious, we tend to order more lab tests. We tend to order more x-rays and scans. This is, this is an expensive problem for hospitals, which is actually a good way to get the attention of the administration. This is a problem not just on a human level, but on an economic level as well. By addressing, treating, and preventing delirium, we can also improve the bottom line. Much more importantly than costs, though, are uh, uh, the effect on the actual patients we care for. So uh, we were actually able to show a mortality um, effect associated with delirium. In our 1,500 patient cohort, uh, mortality rates in children who were never delirious were less than 1%. In children who experienced delirium, it was greater than 5%. After controlling for severity of illness, again, which takes into account all the predictors of mortality, um, ever being delirious, uh, more than quadrupled expected mortality rates. This doesn't just end with hospital discharge. We also have data that shows that children who were delirious during their hospitalization are more likely to be readmitted uh, within three months after discharge when compared to a matched cohort of patients. We've also been able to show an effect on uh, quality of life in children. Uh, we've only looked at children zero to five years old that persists up to three months after discharge. So survivors of PICU delirium aren't doing as well as their matched controls who didn't experience delirium. Very interesting. So how then should we approach the treatment of delirium in these complex critically ill patients? Excellent question. So when a patient is identified as delirious, the first thing I do is not say, what medicine can I give them to make this delirium go away? Instead, I say, why is this child delirious? And I go back to that Venn diagram in my head, where delirium is usually caused by one or two or three things, the underlying disease, 
side effects of treatment, and the abnormal environment. So the first thing I do is I look for an underlying trigger for delirium. Does the child have a new infection uh, that needs to be addressed and treated? In that case, the treatment for delirium in that child might be antibiotics. The next thing I do is I look at the side effects of treatment. I review that med list. I stop the unnecessary anticholinergics. I try to minimize sedation as much as I can. The third thing I do is I look at the environment. I mean, this kid probably hasn't gotten much sleep over the first past few days. Is there a way I can cluster care, provide cognitive stimulation and mobilization during the day so the kid is tired and can actually lay down some sleep at night? By addressing the disease, side effects of treatment, and the abnormal environment, I can improve delirium in more than 80% of, of children. There is a minority of patients, however, where there is this agitated uh, form of delirium that really interferes with treatment. In that minority of patients, again, less than one in five delirious children, we sometimes do need to turn to uh, a pharmacologic management in order to not necessarily cure the delirium, but in order to treat the symptoms long enough that we can chip away at the underlying triggers for delirium. For that, there are no FDA-approved medications in pediatrics for delirium. With that caveat, the two categories of medications that people have had success with at treating some of the agitated symptoms of delirium are the alpha agonists and the atypical antipsychotics. Of the alpha agonists, there is the most evidence for dexmedetomidine. Um, and of the atypical antipsychotics, um, they're probably all similar, but there is the most evidence for quetiapine. There are no studies, actually, that show that these drugs are effective at treating delirium, uh, but there are studies that show that they are safe. So I try to do a risk-benefit analysis. If I have a kid who I need to peel away at some of the offending agents, for example, the benzodiazepine-based sedation, but I need to control their agitation, I may choose one of these two categories of medication uh, to help me address the modifiable deliriogenic factors uh, that are currently part of that patient's care. Okay, so you have convinced us that delirium is a very um, prevalent problem in pediatric critical illness and that it is associated with some very significant um, outcomes. Uh, so how can we prevent this in our critically ill children? That, I think, is probably the most important question. It would be far better to prevent delirium from occurring than it would be to try to treat it after, after it's already been established. Happily, there is a huge amount of data in adults that show us that delirium is, in fact, preventable. This isn't just an epiphenomenon, a side effect of critical illness. This is something that, if we change our practices, we can prevent. Uh, way back in 2012, the Society of Critical Care Medicine released uh, guidelines for pain, agitation, and delirium. They called for an analogous sedation approach um, in critically ill patients where they would optimize pain control but target a very light level of sedation and minimize benzodiazepines. And in so doing, not only decrease delirium but also hopefully improve outcomes. And recent studies have shown that this is highly effective. In fact, the, uh, they just published the results of the ICU Liberation Initiative, which included 15,000 adult patients in 68 different ICUs, where they rolled out these bundles of care that targeted a light level of sedation, minimizing benzodiazepines, screening for delirium, mobilizing patients, and actively involving their families. And what they showed is not only did they decrease delirium rates, they also decreased mortality. So we now know that this can be done. We actually have some evidence in pediatrics as well. Uh, we know that an analogous sedation approach is feasible in children. We've known this since 2011, when uh, Seattle Children's Hospital published the results of their analgesic first approach to sedation. In this study, they enrolled 166 mechanically ventilated children and showed that a morphine-based protocol with lorazepam given only if needed decreased sedation days um, and dramatically decreased benzodiazepine exposure without increasing adverse events. There was no increase in inadvertent extubations in, in that population. 
We know it from a more recent and very exciting study that uh, came out of Advocate Children's Hospital in 2017. This was a randomized, blinded, controlled trial of 78 children who had undergone uh, cardiothoracic surgery. The children were randomized to either a continuous sedation arm, where they received uh, continuous morphine and midazolam infusions, or to a placebo arm, where they received continuous saline. Both arms were allowed to be given open-label doses of morphine and midazolam on an as-needed basis. Shockingly, there was no difference in the number of intermittent doses given between the two groups, between the continuous sedation group as compared to the saline group. Not surprisingly, the children who were getting saline had shorter lengths of both PICU stay and hospital length of stay. What this taught me is that not only is analgo sedation feasible, but that it is also uh, effective at decreasing the, the burden of sedation that we're giving to our patients. For my single institution, I, I know this as well. Um, over about a two-year period, from 2014 to 2016, we were able to uh, dramatically decrease our delirium rates in my unit um, simply by implementing delirium screening. Once we started paying attention to delirium, once we started screening for it, we organically changed the way we went about business. We began using far less benzodiazepines. In fact, our days on mechanical ventilation uh, went from 43% at days with benzodiazepine exposure down to 29%. I had expected that we would increase our use of opiates as a result, kind of band-aid with opiates to make up for that lack of benzos. Happily, that was not true. With less benzodiazepines on board, with less sedation on board, we actually used less opiates. Our opiate use rate went from 55% down to 43%. As a uh, direct effect of decreasing sedation, we were able to increase mobilization, and our delirium rates have uh, gone down considerably. I also want to point out that this is not a single institution phenomenon. This is being replicated in pediatric ICUs across the country. Um, as a shining example, I'll call your attention to the study by Sherry Simone from Maryland, where she implemented a quality improvement initiative in her ICU, where she rolled out three bundles of care over 22 months. The first was implementation of universal delirium screening. The second was protocol-driven sedation, targeting a light level of sedation. And the third was an early mobilization initiative. And she showed this beautiful kind of stepwise decrease in delirium rates over the course of the initiative. Simply implementing universal delirium screening decreased delirium rates. Changing sedation and mobilizing children increased it even further. So again, this is not just a common and serious problem that affects our children. This is something that we can prevent with some thoughtful changes to the way we do business. And times are changing in pediatric critical care. If you uh, search through PubMed, you'll find that prior to 2000, pediatric delirium wasn't really a prominent topic. This wasn't something we intensivists were paying attention to. The adult literature, I think, spurred us to examine this problem in our population. And a PubMed search will show how the amount of research being done on this topic has increased uh, dramatically over the past few years. Uh, this is no longer something that we can, in good conscience, ignore. This is a serious problem with serious effects on short and long-term outcomes in our population. And by re-examining the way we care for the children um, in our units, we can decrease the burden of this serious problem. So Connie, what would you say to um, a center that is interested in screening for delirium and addressing this issue, but is concerned about a lack of psychiatry or psychology resources to support um, evaluating the diagnosis? I would say that they have nothing to fear because it is important to remember that delirium is a medical diagnosis. It isn't an organic psychiatric problem. It's an acute and fluctuating uh, brain problem that's due to the underlying medical illness or its treatment. So psychiatrists can be hugely helpful, especially with difficult refractory cases of delirium. But for the vast majority of delirious children, what is needed 
is the ICU staff, and that's enough. Screening for delirium, diagnosing delirium does not require a psychiatrist, and addressing, treating, and preventing delirium does not either. I work with a spectacular child psychiatrist who is incredibly helpful to me, again, especially with those refractory cases. But in more than 85% of the children with delirium that I've managed, uh, my staff has been able to manage them without uh, using the psychiatric resources that we have available. So this is something that should absolutely be extended to places that don't have uh, the on-site psychiatric involvement that you and I are lucky enough to have as resources. Great, so Connie, you mentioned that one of the three important causes of uh, ICU delirium is the environment in the ICU. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how the family can help um, prevent and address delirium. What an excellent, excellent question. I think family can be hugely helpful as part of not just delirium prevention, but also delirium treatment. Uh, what we've found in my ICU uh, is that empowering the family, empowering the parent uh, to parent uh, the critically ill child is hugely important. When these, when these kids come to our units, we staff unintentionally um, often kind of uh, take over all the caregiving roles and send messages to the parent of stand back and don't touch. Um, and that can be very distressing for the parent, but also for the child who's used to being cared for by their loved ones. So by educating the family, explaining to the family that it's okay for your child to wake up while they're on the ventilator. In fact, we want them to, even if they're a little bit upset. It's better for them than sleeping through their critical illness because a sedated child isn't really sleeping. Once we teach that to the parents, they are our biggest advocates, where when the child wakes up, instead of the nurse running to sedate the child, the mother says, oh great, you're awake. Let's do some of your physical therapy and exercise the child in their bed. So having a uh, invested family member at the bedside is the biggest tool I have in my armamentarium. I don't have it for all my patients, but for those for whom I do have it available, it's a huge factor in how we can prevent uh, delirium in that child. We also encourage the families to um, interact with their child, to stimulate their child during the day, whether it's watching a movie together, reading them a book, uh, providing therapeutic touch. Oftentimes the only time uh, critically ill children are touched is for cares like suctioning, like phlebotomy. So providing uh, comforting to touch, uh, pleasant to touch actually uh, can be hugely helpful. So again, an invested parent is, is worth their weight in gold and should absolutely be operationalized as part of a delirium prevention paradigm. We'd like to turn once more to you and our audience to ask a question. We ask you, please state your city and country location when leaving your comment. What is the role of the patient's family in providing care in your ICU? Well, Connie, thanks again so much for coming uh, to discuss this really important topic um, to all of us and to all of you uh, out there. Thank you so much for watching and uh, please do uh, leave your comments and questions. Thanks.